When I lived on the East Coast, a little town called Newport, North Carolina, there was a member of the church, a quite aged lady, very sweet lady, named Penny Garner, now dead and gone to her reward, who was practically blind. She had to be led about everywhere she went, and her husband was very, very kind and faithful to come with her and bring her to all the services. But her husband was not a Christian. And uh, month after month and into the years, people wondered why Mr. Lloyd Garner never went the gospel. Such a good man, such a quiet man, and yet he never would respond. People talked about it all the time. He's such a good man, they just couldn't figure out why Mr. Lloyd just wouldn't obey the gospel. One day I went to see him, and we were talking, and such a nice man, I saw him got my courage and decided to ask him what he thought about the Church of Christ. And I found out since then that's a pretty good question to ask people. Yes, they talking. And asked him what he thought about the Church of Christ. And he said, Well, if there's a church on earth that stands for the truth, I believe that's the Church of Christ. Well, I was really encouraged by that, so we talked some more, and I said, uh, what do you think about baptism? And tears came in that man's eyes, and he said, the greatest desire of my life is to be baptized. And within an hour, he was a Christian. And you say, well, why in the world wouldn't that man step forward? Why wouldn't he obey the gospel? Why would you have to know him? Something that I didn't know, I found out later. Lloyd Garner had been in prison. He had been a moonshiner. There are a lot of those in North Carolina. And he thought everybody knew it. And he thought everybody looked at him and thought there goes a convict. And he was so bashful that he would never, ever put himself forward. And you think, well, surely with regard to salvation, something so important as that, that he would just have to obey the gospel. Well, he did what he was asked. And what I thought about a lot of times is, what if I never asked him? He didn't live long after that, but he died a Christian. It's a wonderful thing to think about. And I'm wondering now how many people around us here in Austin are not Christians because nobody's ever asked them. In talking about the 11th hour of salvation, Jesus talked about those who were hired early in the day, and then those who were hired in the middle of the day, and then those finally were hired late in the evening. And the same reward, the same pay was given to all of them. And some complained, and of course that story illustrates grace. That though we may all work, that God's grace is the one that gives us the salvation anyway. But the point was that Jesus said of those who were the 11th hour workers that nobody asked them. Nobody asked them. When they finally were asked, they went and worked in the vineyard. And I believe the Bible teaches us that there are good and honest men and women in the world that are not being asked about the gospel of Christ. And we're the ones whom God is depending on to ask. This meeting is very quickly coming to a close. I pray that you will think seriously about what I've said tonight and think that this meeting is not over yet. And after tonight, there will be another opportunity to talk to your neighbors. And maybe bring someone with, you, someone with you that has never known what you know, the wonderful kind of salvation. But you might be instrumental in finding the Lord God. You might be instrumental in finding an 11th hour worker who all the rest of their life will be faithful in God's service and try to find them and bring them to the Lord. As we've been announcing, the subject for this evening is the logic of the plan of salvation. I'm not interested in the word logic at all in the sense of an educational tool whereby we have a major premise and a minor premise and a conclusion. I'm not interested in that at all. I think the plan of salvation will stand up to that kind of logic. But I am saying that behind the plan of salvation there is a heavenly mind. There is a divine wisdom. God, in all his great wisdom, has devised a plan whereby we may be saved. The Roman letter speaks of the fact that God can be both just and the justifier of those that believe in Jesus Christ. The Bible says that the soul that sins shall die. We have sinned, we ought to die. But by the grace of God, someone has stepped in our place. Jesus Christ gave his life that we might live. And by the death that Jesus died, God can still punish sin and remain just. You see, if Jesus, or rather God, had ignored the sin problem, he could not have been just. Because the very thing that he says with regard to sin, that it's against his nature, and that sinners must be punished is true because God is righteous. At the same time, since God said that the sinner was going to suffer death, then he would have had to fulfill that or he would have been alive. 
Therefore, God, in order to be just and the justifier of those who believe in Jesus Christ, had to give his son to die on the cross. Behind all of that is a logic. Behind all of that is a divine wisdom. The Apostle Paul spoke of that when in Ephesians chapter 3, he spoke of the plan of redemption that was in the mind of God. He said, beginning with verse 8 of Ephesians 3, To me, who am blessed the least of all the saints, this grace was given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all people see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Jesus Christ, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places, according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. This says that what God was doing through Jesus Christ was a product of the divine wisdom of God. When therefore you see the gospel plan of salvation declared in its fulfillment and its, its fullness, you have the will of God and the mind of God being expressed. It is the wisdom of God. I'm going to read with you tonight those, those accounts of the Great Commission. If you would please turn to Matthew chapter 28 and begin reading with me with verse 18. Then Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. In Mark's account of that, in Mark chapter 16, verses 15 and 16, we have this reading. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. In the gospel according to Luke now, beginning in chapter 24, and beginning with verse 45, Jesus says, And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. And, and then he said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer to rise from the day of the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning in Jerusalem. These are the marching orders for the disciples of Jesus Christ who are going to take the plan of salvation into the world. I believe tonight that if we ought to preach that plan of salvation with all confidence and all boldness. Jesus in Matthew chapter 18 said of those who would cause one to stumble, it would be better that a millstone be hung about their neck or tied about their neck and they be cast into the depths of the sea. That's the kind of an attitude that God has towards someone who leads the one astray that's planning to, or seeking the plan of salvation. It gives me a great deal of comfort and joy tonight to be able to preach the same gospel in Austin, Texas that the twelve apostles preached in the city of Jerusalem in Acts chapter 2. It gives me a great deal of confidence tonight to be able to preach in Austin, Texas, what Jesus said in Matthew 28, what Jesus said in Mark 16, what Jesus said in Matthew 24. I would have a great deal of problem trying to stand here tonight knowing what I know about the Bible and preach from the Methodist discipline. I would have a great deal of problem trying to defend infant baptism. I would have a great deal of problem trying to defend what saved, always saved or salvation by faith alone. I have a great deal of problem trying to preach those things because they do not jive. They do not harmonize with the gospel of Jesus Christ. But tonight when I leave here, I will know that having preached about the logic of the plan of salvation, with all the confidence that I have in knowing what I know, I believe that Jesus himself will say amen to what is going to be preached here tonight. Because we're going to preach from the word of God that which will save men and women. The Bible tells us that we're to go into the world looking for those that are lost and preach to them the gospel of Jesus Christ that the kingdom of God might be filled up. In Acts chapter 2, you have the apostles beginning on the day of Pentecost as they received the Holy Spirit and were moved to speak by the Holy Spirit in other tongues, to preach in other tongues. They preached the gospel plan of salvation. I'm confident tonight that the apostles fulfilled exactly what Jesus told them to preach they were preaching the Great Commission Gospel. Someone says, well, did the, did the Lord really mean 
what he said in Matthew 28 and Mark 16. Yes, he really meant that. And the apostle, by the guidance of the Holy Spirit, really preached what Jesus said in Acts chapter 2. Their comprehension under the guidance of the Holy Spirit and their preaching in Acts chapter 2 coincided exactly with what the Great Commission said rather than to preach and the three instances that, that we looked at tonight. So then when we look at this plan of salvation, we recognize that God is not a God of confusion, 1 Corinthians chapter 14. So what he wanted to be preached in the first century is what he wants to then preach tonight. We need also to recognize that the logic of the plan of salvation says that there's a divine wisdom behind it. So then when the plan of salvation is preached, it is a preaching of that which contains the very wisdom of God. Now, if that's true, and I believe that it is, the plan of salvation takes its nature from him who gives it. That is, the plan of salvation is not arbitrary. The plan of salvation is not unfair. The plan of salvation is not something impossible to achieve. But rather, the God who made us, the God who witnessed our downfall and sin, and the God who wants us to come back and love to him and be restored, he is the God who speaks to the end that we might be saved. I'm saying that the plan of salvation takes its nature from him who, who gave it. And that the plan of salvation is so eminently fair and is filled with the grace of God, whereby he wants people to be saved. Second Peter chapter 3 and verse 9 asserts that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Therefore, God's logic, God's wisdom, God's divine mind, is behind the plan of salvation. With that in mind, then I think there's some things about this, that the plan of salvation will always take its character from him who gave it. If that's true, then it must agree with what truth is, because God is the source of all truth. First of all, I want to suggest that the plan of salvation, in order to be the plan of salvation, must be true in all its parts. That is, there will never be a lack of harmony within the various aspects of the plan of salvation. Whatever plan of salvation that we look at, from whatever viewpoint we view it as a, as a total, or whether we look at the individual aspects of the gospel of Jesus Christ, it always will make sense because it will be truth in all the various parts of that. Let me suggest to you a contrast to show that that's not the case. Satanists require, in some cases, some branches of Satanism, require that those who join the Satanist movement have to, have to cause someone to die. In all of you to belong to the Satanist church, in some sections of that, that's not true for all of them, but it is with some of them, you have to cause either an animal or a human being to be put to death to show that you're willing to be a part of that dark-sided movement. Well, it does not coincide with truth then for me to think that I've got to take something's life in order to be a part of that kind of religious movement. And that could be the same thing can be expressed with regard to other religious movements. But first of all, notice that for the plan of salvation to be according to the Word of God, it must be true in all its parts. The next thing is that all these parts must agree. All these parts must agree within themselves. You're not going to find a part of the plan of salvation that contradicts another part of the plan of salvation. The Apostle Paul spoke of the fact that in Corinth there were, there were divisions and jealousies within the church over the use of spiritual gifts. His answer to that is, how in the world can you be jealous of spiritual gifts? Because they all come from the same spirit. Therefore, all of them edify the body. And the same thing is true in the plan of salvation. You cannot have plans of salvation that contradict and then come from God because God agrees in the Godhead with each other, and the wisdom of God will never contradict itself. Now to show you that that is not always the case, in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, the Apostle Paul could have said that we are saved by grace through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. When the Bible says that not of yourselves, of what is the Apostle speaking? Someone said, well, that's gift. That the gift is faith. That God must give you faith. Well, that cannot be true because if that's true, that God is a, is a respected person. Only those people who believe, but not under those circumstances, could come to God and, and receive grace. Therefore, if God gives someone faith, they're going to be saved. If he doesn't give somebody else faith, they're going to be lost. And you've got unfairness in God's dealing with mankind. 
But when you understand the hierarchy of grace and faith, grace is God's part reaching down to man's need. Faith is man's part reaching up to meet God's grace. And there's a happy union of grace and faith, and they never contradict one another. Grace, properly understood, always agrees with faith, properly understood. But you have sometimes people who will try to talk about the doctrine of salvation by faith alone. Well, that violates grace. Then you have somebody who talks about salvation being holy of grace, and that violates faith. The gospel of Jesus Christ never violates any of its parts. Furthermore, the end result of the final salvation, for it to be what God would have it to be, is that it must reach its designed goal. That is, it must achieve the salvation that we all need. On the other hand, denominational people do not preach that gospel, and I would not for all the money in the world stand in the shoes of Billy Graham and people like him, who have, because of their great oratorical ability, their great ability to speak, have been able to stir men to try to seek after God, and then they give them a false message, and they tell them they're saved before they are saved, and cause them to stop looking for salvation. There are many people that are going to go to judgment unprepared to meet God, not having fulfilled the plan of salvation, because Billy Graham teaches the doctrine of salvation by faith alone, and does not tell the whole gospel of Jesus Christ. So when you look at the plan of salvation, for it to be the salvation the Bible speaks about, number one, it must be true in all its parts. Secondly, all the parts must agree, and it must achieve its desired goal. I say to you that the gospel of Jesus Christ fulfills all of those things. It is true in all of its parts. Nothing that is accurately preached about the plan of salvation will contradict any other part of the plan of salvation, and the end result is the salvation of those that are lost in sin. When I say that final salvation will never contradict itself, I've been to debate between denominational preachers and gospel preachers, and the denominational preacher will have a list of 300 scriptures, let's say, that talks about salvation by faith. And he interprets every one of those to mean salvation by faith alone. And so he presents 300 scriptures and says, I've proven my case, salvation is by faith alone. Well, he hasn't proven his case at all. All he's proven is that salvation includes great uh, uh, faith as something that man must do in coming to God. And I believe, even every Christian believes, every one of those scriptures. None of those scriptures deny the, the role of anything else in the time of salvation. And so it agrees with all its parts. So then we need to recognize tonight that those groups of people, people who do not understand or preach the plan of salvation as God intends for it to be preached, actually contradicts what the Bible teaches about these matters. Errors of men make the plan of salvation incomprehensible. It is so sad to recognize that in Austin, Texas tonight, there are people of good and honest heart who really want to do what God tells them to do, but they're being led astray by false teachers and false doctrine. And you can see how that would be, be so. For example, there are those who teach that universalism is true and that God is not going to condemn anybody to be saved. Well, if that were true, then there's no logic to the plan of salvation. Because there's no justice for evildoers. If all men are going to be saved, that tells me that Adolf Hitler is going to go to heaven. Now I'm going to tell you, if Adolf Hitler is saved, after all the murder and mayhem and sorrow that he brought into the world, if he goes to heaven, there's no justice in the world. Because he died an impenitent man by his own hand. If Adolf Hitler is going to be saved, like a man and a woman who are penitent and want to do what God tells them to be saved, then God is not fair and the plan of salvation is not logical. Universalism is error and does not teach what the Bible actually teaches. On the other hand, there are those that are called the world religions, Buddhism and is the Islamic faith and all of these various things. And yet they deny that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And all of those religions that were begun by a man that man died, and that man is still in the grave. How is a man who's still in the grave needing his redemption going to tell me how I can be saved? He needs salvation as much as I need salvation. So these individuals that deny that Jesus Christ is the Son of God have no logic because we are in the same boat. They're people, they have flesh and blood like I do, and they're going to die, and I'm going to die, and none of us of our own wisdom can decide what the final salvation really is. 
Furthermore, I know that those creeds that suggest that the Bible cannot be understood are not logical because we have an expression of the divine mind of God being revealed to us. And notice that God requires of us that we understand. Ephesians 3 and verse 4 says that when we have read, we will understand the, the mystery of Christ just like Paul did. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 17 says, Be not foolish, but understand the will of the Lord. God addresses His mind to our level of understanding. That's the accommodation that God has given to us. That I might come to know the will of God. God has not spoken in terms above and beyond my comprehension. He speaks on my level. I can understand. With that in mind, then, we come to the plan of salvation in the sense that the Word of God is the expression of the mind of God. Listen to the character of what I say, that where the seed has not gone, faith cannot be created. There must be the planting of the seed before salvation can take place. There are those in the religious world who think that the Holy Spirit operates independently of the Word of God. But it is logical to understand that in the animal world, in the vegetable world, in the human family, and in the spiritual world, God always requires seed for propagation. In the beginning, God started life with a miracle. From that time onward, He always begins life with a seed. That is no different in the Word of God in Luke 8 and verse 11. In the parable of the sower, Jesus said that the seed is the Word of God. Further, we were told very clearly that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Romans 10 and verse 17. In John 6, verses 44 and 45, Jesus said, He that hath heard and hath learned cometh unto me. The logic of the plan of salvation begins with the understanding that God's Word breaks into my heart and causes the seed to be planted so that I might have a germination of faith in my life. The logic of the plan of salvation says that God's mind speaks to my mind. And where the mind of God has not spoken, that I cannot know the plan of salvation. I must know the plan of salvation first of all. Then that also tells me that once I have heard the word of God, the word of God is powerful and sharper than into a sword, Hebrews 4, beginning in verse 11 and verse 12. The Bible also tells me that you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. With regard to that, I know that faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, logically, we can see that progression is from the fact that the Word of God is preached and faith is the result. Jesus said, except you believe that I am He, you will die in your sins. Since God has directed His revelation toward me, the end result of that Word is that I create faith in my heart. Hebrews 11 verse 6 says, without faith it is impossible to be a pleasing unto God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he's a reward of those that diligently seek after him. I know, therefore, that the logic of the plan of salvation suggests progression. That is, there is a beginning and there is an end. And the progression from that plan, from the beginning to the end, is that we might understand some things and change relationships. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 13 speaks of those who were in the kingdom of darkness, but they've been translated out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of the Son of His love. That's a progression from one place to another, a change of relationship. But salvation, therefore, in the logic of it, in the wisdom of the divine mind, is He's going to take us from darkness and establish us into the kingdom of God's dear Son. That is begun by faith. Hebrews chapter 11 gives us an example of faith as an evidence of things that we cannot see. And though I do not know from my own personal testimony that I have seen Jesus Christ risen from the dead, I have the testimony of those who have spoken. Let me tell you something. When you begin recognizing uh, so many things, we believe by faith. Faith is not at all unusual in our life. But I don't think we ought to talk about religion being a blind leap. I have never believed that religion or that faith is a blind leap, that you just Leap out into nothingness and hope that God is going to catch you. I don't believe that's doing the religion of Jesus Christ a service when you call faith a blind leap. The reason why that's so is because that faith is based upon very solid evidence. If you're called in the court of law and you 
have been uh, selected to sit on a jury. The judge or the court system is going to bring into the courtroom those that are involved, the principals, and they're going to bring in the witnesses of what took place. In any court of law, the procedure whereby a juror is able to make a decision is, first of all, there has been uh, something take place, an event. To that event, there have been some eyewitnesses. Those eyewitnesses give their testimony. And based upon their testimony, you as a juror render a verdict based on what you have been led to believe about the, the event that took place. I say to you that faith in Jesus Christ is as logical as the court system in this country in the highest sense of the term. That is, Jesus Christ is a historical event. Jesus really lived. Jesus died. Now, I wasn't there. I didn't see that. But the fact remains that there were eyewitnesses, and throughout the New Testament, the book of Acts particularly, but throughout the New Testament, there is the word witnessing used in the sense of the Scriptures, not the Jehovah's Witnesses, but in the legal sense that it's used as these individuals who were eyewitnesses of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. They are men whose testimony is above reproach because they're ready to lay down their life for what they knew to be the truth. They saw what took place, the event. They gave their testimony as eyewitnesses. And we who have their testimony in the scriptures render a verdict based upon the evidence. Now then, if you're going to say that I don't believe that Jesus Christ really lived by the same thinking that you take out of your life, the faith in Jesus Christ, I will remove out of your life anything that you haven't personally witnessed. Now that's far reaching, but that's true. For example, I've never been in China. And I don't know that China exists from a personal viewpoint. But there are people who've been there, they say, and they are, China therefore is events. It is a fact. There are people who've been there who are eyewitnesses. And they've made atlases, maps, and they've written about China. Therefore, I believe in China. But you see, the reason why I believe in China is based on the same reasoning that I believe in Jesus Christ being real. And somebody says, well, you, don't, you can't believe in Jesus Christ because you didn't really see him. The whatever logic you deny my faith in Jesus Christ, I'm going to deny your faith in anything you haven't personally seen. On the other hand, if you can justify your faith in anything that you haven't personally seen based on legitimate testimony, by the same reasoning that you come to that conclusion, I come to the same conclusion that Jesus Christ really lived and died and was raised from the dead. And I say that faith is logical. Faith is exactly what we ought to have based upon the testimonies and the evidence that is there. But now then, once I believe in Jesus Christ, what's next? Well, do we have some kind of a church convention where we write out a creed and say, now the way that we go about this is we believe and then we repent. There are some who say that you repent and then you believe. What's the order? What's the logical sequence of events? Well, the Bible says that once you have faith, that means that you're going to have something happen to you, that if you believe in Jesus Christ, and as was preached in Acts chapter 2, to those individuals on the day of Pentecost that believed that Jesus Christ or heard the testimony preached that Jesus had been crucified and they were guilty of it, they were pricked in their hearts. And the point of it is when you come to the realization that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and we are sinners and by our sins we have crucified Jesus. Now, it wasn't just those people in Jerusalem that crucified Jesus. I know that Jesus went to the cross the cause of the sins of Jews. I know that Jesus went to the cross because of the sins of the Jews. But no more so or no less so did he go to the cross because of my sins. I also put Jesus on the cross and so did you. And therefore when I hear the faith preached about Jesus Christ that he's the son of God, it does something to me and that it causes me to repent of my sins. Jesus said in Luke 13 verse 3, except you repent, you'll all in like manner perish. Repentance is defined as a change of mind. Matthew chapter 21 speaks of the two sons and how repentance is really of the one who changed his mind and went. So it's a change of mind followed by a change of life. 
And once you understand that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, then truly and indeed, people are going to repent. And repentance is essential, but the connection of it is that we believe, therefore we repent. The Baptist Church has an odd approach to this that is not logical. They say that you're saved the instant, the moment that you believe. It's an instantaneous thing. The moment that faith arrives in your heart, you're saved that instant. What about the devil? On the circumstances. What about the Where does it go? You're saved, you believe, and you're saved. Does the repentance come after salvation? Jesus said in Luke 13, verse 3, except you repent, you'll have all that matter perish. We know that repentance is unto salvation, Acts 2 and verse 38. We know that repentance is unto life. God has granted the Gentile repentance unto life, Acts chapter 10. And so when we begin looking at these things, you recognize that there's a logic to the plan of salvation in the sense that you hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, for there's no seed, there can be no life. Therefore, once you hear that gospel, you are led to faith in Jesus Christ. And because you believe and you understand that you are responsible for the sin or for the death of Jesus on the cross, then you're led to penitence. That's the natural order of things. But in the Baptist way of teaching, that's not the logical order. And they cannot allow that to be so. Don't you understand that the Baptist church teaches that the instant you are saved, of the instant you believe you're saved, therefore repentance cannot come at the same time that faith comes. And in their preaching, they will say, repent and believe. But that presents a problem. Hebrews 11 verse 6 says, Without faith it's impossible to be a pleased in God. And who in the world is going to repent when they don't believe in Jesus Christ? So they're on the horns of a real dilemma. If they put faith and repentance under their teaching, it's faith, salvation, and repentance. So they're repenting after they're saved. And that is not biblical. On the other hand, if they say that I repent and then believe because I'm saved the instant I believe and I must repent before I believe, that doesn't work. Because repentance without faith doesn't work either. The Baptist doctrine is not logical, nor is it scriptural. On the other hand, when we understand that salvation is incomplete without repentance, then we know exactly where it comes. Then having repented, we come to the point where in the past I have loved to sin. I've been engaging in sinful practices, but because I know Christ, and because the love of God constrains me, and because I know the goodness of God leads me to repentance, then once I believe in Jesus Christ and repent of my sins, the next thing is to change my attitude and amount my allegiance to Jesus Christ. And thus I'm going to declare that Jesus Christ is the Son of God as an act of my faith. And Jesus said, except you confess that I am He, you'll die in your sins. He will not confess you before the angel of the Father if you do not confess Him before men. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 32. Romans 10 and verse 10, confession is unto salvation. So then I understand that, that confession in the name of Jesus Christ is essential to salvation. And I'm not yet saved. I'm in the process of being saved. And the, the confession that we make is a part of that logical order. There's no conflict or contradiction between the confession of my faith in Jesus Christ because I repent. There is no conflict or contradiction between faith and repentance in their proper order of things. The Baptist Church, again, I'm not trying to pick you from the Baptist Church tonight, but because they do teach so many people so much error, when you look at for them, they will say that you're saved at the point of faith. The instant you believe is instantaneous. When you believe, you're saved. And later on, because you are saved, you won't be that type. They'll try to tell you that the word I, or unto, in the preposition in the New Testament, where you are uh, repent and be baptized unto salvation, so that means because of salvation. Therefore, every Christian they teach ought to be baptized. And that when you believe, you're saved, and then you're baptized because you are saved. Well, let's just look at the logic of the of the New Testament. We understand the word and is a coordinate conjunction. And the work that that does in the English language, in the Greek language, and everywhere else it appears, is it joins together words and phrases of equal importance in a sentence. And someone has compared that to a coupler on a train. You understand that when you have a coupler on a train, that it hooks together cars. And because they're coupled together, they have to go in the same direction. They just have to. 
And that's the work that the word and does in Acts 2.38. So when the Bible says repent and be baptized, follow the remission of sins, whatever it is that repentance does for <coughs> salvation, whichever direction it goes in, baptism has to go in the same direction. Did you see that? If repentance is unto salvation, baptism is unto salvation. John did the same direction. Do that in Mark chapter 16, verse 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. We've got that word and again. And we have faith now and repentance being joined together in that sentence and in the Great Commission. Somebody says we're saved by faith. And we're baptized because we have been saved. They've got faith and baptism going two different directions. Now that's not logic from a human standpoint, and it does violence to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Furthermore, they say we're saved because, we're baptized because we have been saved. And they say that's what that word means. Unto salvation means because of salvation, or for salvation. Well, let's go back to Matthew chapter 26. And there, when he's talking about Jesus giving the Lord's Supper, he said that, Jesus, that the blood of Jesus Christ was shed for remission of sins. Now, if for remission of sins in Acts 2.38 is because of remission of sins, it is the same word used in Matthew chapter 26. Therefore, Jesus died because the sins of the world were already forgiven. Does that make any sense? Of course it doesn't. I don't have to say that there is inherently true in all the systems of doctrines of men flaws. If you will apply consistently the truth of God, every doctrine of man is flawed. It will not stand the logic. There is a logic in the plan of salvation that begins with the sinner where he is. And God has in his mind a divine wisdom by which this sinner can be translated into a saved relationship. And all parts of that plan of salvation is going to agree. There will never be a conflict. But if you try to change a single part of the plan of salvation, that human element will always violate the plan of salvation. It's just that way. It can be no other way. Because God's way is perfect. And when we try to change it to suit our own ideas, it's going to violate the logic of the plan of salvation. So we confess the name of Jesus Christ to show our change of allegiance, but we're still not saved. We're still in all condition of sin. And unless and until we're baptized in Jesus Christ, we remain in our sins, because baptism is the only thing that brings us in contact with the blood of Christ. Did you ever really stop and wonder why the Bible says you're baptized into the death of Jesus? We hear so much about, especially around Christmas time, about the birth of Jesus. Why does the Bible not say you're baptized in the birth of Jesus? And we hear a lot of people, particularly among Calvinistic churches, talking about the life of Christ, the perfect life of Christ. And I'm so thankful for the perfect life of Christ because it qualified him to be the perfect sacrifice. But the Bible doesn't anywhere say that you're baptized into the life of Christ. But it does say that you're baptized into the death of Christ. Now, why is that so? Well, it's so clear that you're baptized into the death of Christ because in his death is where his blood is shed. I'm not saved by the waters of baptism. But God planned salvation so that I could reenact in my obedience to the gospel of Jesus Christ. I reenact the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And what that's saying is that because I'm being baptized into the death of Christ, I'm showing not only my personal faith individually, but I'm declaring to the world by this act of confession in the name of Christ and by being baptized that I believe I am reenacting the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. My faith is in Him and the salvation is brought by the blood. Not too long ago, I had the privilege of baptizing a young girl down in Costa Crockett, Texas. She grew up as a, a, a girlfriend of my daughter and she had never been baptized. She came to the meeting uh, about a month ago there, and we talk, I talked to her a little bit before the services started, and then talked to her later after the services, and she decided to be baptized. And her daddy is not a Christian, so she said, I'm going to go home and be baptized in my swimming pool. Well, that was great, and of course it was a beautiful night. We gathered around, and the members of the church went out in the swimming pool, and we gathered there, and she made her confession of faith out on the stars around that swimming pool. Her dad was standing there. 
And uh, we baptized Janine into Christ, and the whole family was very pleased and thrilled about it. Then she talked to me the next day. She called me and she said, I, in fact, after that was over, I talked to her father a little bit. And I, com I commended him on the fact that his daughter loved the Lord so much and was ready to put Christ into her life. And that I hoped that would make an impression on him. And that I hope one of these days that someone would be able to baptize him into Christ too. And ask him to call us and we could study with him. But it didn't the same thing at the time, but the next day Janine called me and uh, asked me to study with him a little bit. We talked about some things. He said, I had a I had an interesting thing last night. I want to ask you what you think about it. He said, he said my daddy asked me, a young girl, my daddy asked me to baptize him in the swimming pool. What do you think about that? Well, quite frankly, I've never been faced with that before. But he didn't want anybody to know that he was being baptized. He wanted her to do it so nobody would know it. And I said, Janine, what does the Bible say about confessing the name of Christ? You cannot be a secret disciple. The Bible talks about those who have faith in Jesus Christ, but they would not name him, would not confess him, because they feared the people. And they were rebuked by the Lord because their faith was not the kind of faith that would tell them to stand forth and declare their faith. And I don't believe that you can be a secret disciple and go to heaven. I believe you can be a secret disciple and be ashamed to confess the name of Christ and still obey the gospel. Baptism that ignores the other parts of the plan of salvation is not baptism of the New Testament Lord. And if you want to ignore Christ and refuse to confess his name, your baptism is not valid. It's not Bible baptism. But baptism understands faith. Baptism understands repentance. Baptism understands the confession and allegiance that you give publicly. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Jesus said, if you don't have the courage to confess me before men, I'm not confess you before the angels of my father. And my advice was to her go back and tell her father that he had to confess Christ. He had to have the courage to be able to confess Jesus Christ. And if he wants somebody to baptize him, I've never made an issue about who does the baptizing. And I don't think I'd make an issue about who does the baptizing. After reading the Corinthian letter, the Apostle Paul and and those people that had problems with that, well, I'm going to tell you something. I have trouble with a man wanting to be that baptized who was ashamed to stand up and confess his Savior who died on the cross on We need to understand that baptism by itself doesn't save. And when we start talking about baptism, sometimes we need to tell people the whole story, the logic of the plan of salvation. It's wrong to say that baptism saves without saying the rest of the story, what faith plays in it, and what repentance plays in it, and what confession plays in it, as it is to say that faith saves and leave baptism out of it. Because it's all a part of the whole. And when you get through by teaching all the plan of salvation, people respond to that. That is the wisdom of God in action. So that men and women can be saved from their sins and God remain just to justify those who would have faith in Jesus Christ. That's the logic of the plan of salvation. I believe tonight that it's just as logical to follow through with that and see that every piece fits just exactly in the plan of salvation the way God wants it to. But if I try to remove a single part of it, or if I try to rearrange the part, somebody says, well, I know you people in church Christ hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. Why can't you hear, confess, believe, be baptized, repent? Is that right? Well, see, it doesn't make any sense that way. Why is anybody going to repent when they don't believe? Why would anybody confess when they don't believe? Why would anybody be baptized when they don't believe? And the order, not because this is some church convention where we read the creed, written the creed book and decide that this is the order we're going to follow. Here, believe, repent, confess, be baptized. That's not simply something the church of Christ decided to do. And I'm going to tell you the plan of salvation was not invented by the church of Christ. It's the will of God. There may be someone here tonight who's not a Christian. If I never preach this lesson, the plan of salvation is there in the Bible. And you can read it and you can understand it. So you go to the book of Acts and you'll see hearing and believing, repenting and confessing. You're going to find that order through the book of Acts. And when men were lost and they were presenting Jesus Christ with the gospel, the gospel did its wonderful work. We sang the song a moment ago. By Jesus' saves. 
That's the story of Saul. And when you go from the book of Acts, you're going to see the logic of that so clearly demonstrated. The apostles received the Great Commission. They preached the Great Commission. And we have the Great Commission gospel in our hands in the New Testament today. And when I stand before someone and preach that Great Commission gospel tonight in Austin, Texas, I can lay my head on my pillow and not fear that I have preached something that will cause people to lose their souls. And I believe that when you understand and obey the gospel of Jesus Christ, you'll be saved tonight, just like 3,000 were saved on the day of Pentecost. I thought what a marvelous thing it would be to have been present in Acts 2 and to see 3,000 people be baptized. Stories told about a gospel preacher that went somewhere and held a meeting. And uh, I had, had a whole week, or maybe back then, probably maybe two weeks, 10 days or two weeks, only one young girl was baptized. And uh, he, he told someone how disappointed he was that during the course of the whole meeting, only one young girl was baptized. And uh, the story is told that that young girl was a woman who later became the matriarch of the Wallace clan. She was the old lady that finally, the young girl that later became Sister Wallace, who was the mother of many gospel preachers. And through her and through her faith, countless thousands of people are Christians today because of the preaching of the Wallace men and the preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. We've already gone beyond the one young girl in baptism, one young man that came back to the Lord. We want to pray and work with the idea that even more will obey the gospel. Remember, Mr. Lord Garner, that you leave the building tonight, and think of somebody in your neighborhood that might obey the gospel if you'd ask them. But tonight there may be someone in this audience who are not Christians. Someone who's never understood the gospel of salvation. But understands tonight clearly the cause of the gospel of Christ, what God wants you to do. If you understand, we invite you tonight to respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Come down to the front and ask 3,000 dead of the of Pentecost, confess the name of Christ. Because of your faith in Jesus and because of the penitence of sin, and baptized for all the remission of your sins. You need to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. We invite you to the front now. We'll stand together while we sing. Thank you, God.